All right, we are live, episode nine of the sales series. I've got Matt Davis from Kettle and Fire. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. This is going to be a good one. Everybody knows I love these sales series. It's kind of a new little genre within the Let's Eat program. Uh, short, quick, value-add items uh, for those of us in the CPG space. Give us a little info on Kettle and Fire just so we have context of where you're at right now. Got it. Okay. Um, short and quick is difficult for me, admittedly, though, Mark, like many salespeople. And I once had a boss, Frank Zamparty, who told me, don't bill me the clock, just tell me the time. So I'll do my best to uh, do short and quick answers. Um, but with Kettle and Fire, I joined uh, a little bit about two and a half years ago. Um, the brand started off um, online, direct to consumer entered brick and mortar retail about three and a half years ago. Um, and it's been a, a journey to the top from there. And, uh, you know, strong finish to last year, strong start to this year. Um, things are going really well. What is the product? The product is bone broth. Um, so, you know, if you want, I'll, I'll give you a little company history. Um, our founders, Nick and Justin Mayers, um, started the company about six years ago. Um, Nick was a high school athlete, had a soccer injury, uh, was having a hard time recovering from his injury. His older brother, Justin, introduced him to bone broth, uh, felt very much like bone broth and the, you know, the healing powers of bone broth with gut health and joint health and collagen, protein, all the things, um, very nutrient dense food products um, was part of his uh, path to recovery. Um, but he also, six years ago, it was really hard to find high quality, shelf stable bone broth. So as Nick's, brother, or Nick's friends were all graduating from high school and going on to college, Nick decided to start Kettle and Fire and um, it, it's seeking to, to bring the health benefits of bone broth to the general population uh, in a shelf stable format. Health benefits of bone broth. We get that. Love that. Let's talk sales deck. This is going to be super hyper-focused sales stuff. Do you bring a sales deck into your meetings? Um, it usually, I do bring a sales deck into the meeting, but uh, usually try to keep it in the folder. Um, I feel like a sales deck is important because it helps you prepare for the meeting. Um, but the best meetings I've been a part of over the past 25 years, you know, calling on buyers and category managers at, at various levels are those meetings where the deck doesn't even come out of the bag, doesn't even come out of the folder, very conversational. How many pages would you say a deck should have if there is one and give us four or five pages that should be on it? Uh, if there is a deck, I, I think it largely depends on um, if you're meeting with somebody for the first time. Um, or if you're meeting with somebody for the 10th the, the time. But let's just say kind of happy medium there. Um, I like to keep uh, my sales decks to 10 pages and under. Um, I think it's really important uh, if you have data, and not all brands at different stages have robust data, but if you have uh, data, it's good to start off with a category update, you know, very super high level, 35,000 feet. You know, what's, the, what's the category doing? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Um, and then from there, who are the brands that play within that category? Uh, and what are they doing? Uh, and, and then drill down from there. So I think it's really important to look at it from a, a category standpoint. Um, and then think about what's relevant for the retailer and the buyer that you're working with. Are they interested in seeing, um, you know, the rest of market data is usually pretty important uh, to a retailer. Um, their, their own information, their own data is more meaningful. But, you know, as small brands, we don't always have that kind of data. So sometimes we have to show geographic data uh, rather than account specific data and things like that. Um, I think, we're, yeah. We're going to talk about the few different brands. We're just going to touch on because of your experience. But speaking, since we're talking about those particular meetings, how important is it to be in there either solo, let's say VP of sales, director of sales, head of sales? Are you in there solo or do you like it if a founder is part of those meetings? Again, you've been part of different circumstances as far as smaller to, to larger brands, but just give us your take on that. I think that, um, you know, there are some buyers and category managers that really enjoy time spent with a founder and that's a value add in and of itself. Um, so I think it's important to know, you know, which, which customers, which buyers really enjoy and appreciate that. Um, I also, you know, on the flip side of that, I think it's important that, um, you know, you don't have too many chefs in the kitchen uh, during the meeting 
and you stay laser focused on what you're there to do. So it doesn't turn in, if you have a 30 minute meeting and the first 25 minutes are, you know, talking to the founder about the history and things like that, then you've got five minutes left to really get your message across and, and, and achieve your goals. So I think it's a, a balance and a happy meeting and just knowing your customer and what they, what they appreciate and what they enjoy. You talked about a clock item. I thought that was a great reference. Uh, as salespeople, we love to talk. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's that simple. Uh, and then I, I write about it and I talk about it too, about sort of, you got to listen more than you, you're talking, right? That's where you're getting the information from. That's how you know how to respond. You may totally miss the whole point of, of how it is that you're going to get in there or how you're going to get a sale done because you weren't listening. Give us any tricks that you may be, you know, be, be using or that you've used in the past that helps you sort of calm that method so that you can deliver on, on sort of that theme. Okay. And I think the first thing that jumped to my mind goes back to the question, the previous question, like how many people should you bring to a meeting? Um, and I usually like to have two people in the meeting, um, you know, to have two sets of uh, eyes and ears on what's happening in the meeting and somebody that's designated to take notes and somebody that's designated to lead the meeting. So that's certainly one of the, the things that I've deployed over the years where that's possible. And now in this age of COVID with Zoom meetings and things like that, um, it's a lot easier to accomplish that, uh, less travel involved and um, you know, easier to execute by having somebody else on the line with you to, to, take, to take notes. Um, I also try to remind myself going into the meeting that you know, God gave us um, two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? I'm sure you've heard that one before too. And um, you're right. I do tend to talk a lot. Um, we all do as salespeople. We have a lot of stuff that we want to say, uh, but it is really important to um, say what you want to say, keep the meeting on track. Um, but listen, it's amazing. Uh, silence is awkward. Um, but some of the best pieces of information that I've gotten and some of the best results I've gotten from sales meetings has been um, being silent and letting the person across the desk talk. And it's pretty incredible what um, you can uncover through that process. Uh, I think that's a great answer. I, I'm going to have a specific, um, a specific sort of scenario that just came for, on my side that I, I just had last week. It, I had the most important meeting set up. And um, it, I'll, again, I'll explain what it was later because there's, so, there's context to it and it's an important one. I, I want to see how it plays out, of course, first. But the person on the other end could not believe that I didn't just jump into it. And I don't know if I was necessarily prepared. I just knew that I was going to take myself down because I could get very excited. I'm gonna, I yeah. get excited <laughs> sometimes. And, um, and this particular person that I had a meeting with was long time coming. And I had planned this thing like three years ago. It was like, literally, it's one of those ones. And I didn't even go into my pitch. I literally asked him a question. I could tell he was taken back a little bit. The answer he provided me was the whole theme of the, of the meeting. And it had nothing to do with what it is that I was going into pitch for. It had context to the whole theme and it could provide an end result that I wanted, but it had nothing to do with what it is that I was gonna go in there to pitch for. So anyway, just they, hopefully somebody gets that and says, okay, I need to just be asking more questions. Yes, let's do that. Now let's get into this, Matt. Um, you've been at some really cool CPG companies before, Pirate Brands for one, uh, I think is where you kind of like got your, you know, you got wet for a little bit, right? Give us a couple of the brands that, that you've been a part of and what do you think the themes were as far as helping you as a salesperson? Okay, yeah, um, well, I started off my career in the snack uh, business, the small family owned business um, called Her Foods located outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, so when you invited me to a let's eat episode, um, I was all in because I love to eat and uh, I love to snack and, um, you know, started off there was a part of uh, pirates beauty, as you mentioned for about four and a half years, um, built, built that up together with a phenomenal team and brand, um, before exiting to B and G foods back in 2013, um, ended up joining up with, uh, some of the band again over at bark thins, 
um, worked together there for a couple years uh, before uh, Hershey acquired Barkton's in 2016. Um, and then eventually ended up over here at Kettle and Fire. And um, some of the themes that I have seen was the successful brands that I've been a part of is having a great team and a great brand. Um, if you have a great team and a great brand, you're unstoppable. Um, if you have one and not the other, it's a, it's a lot more difficult uh, to go out and execute and do what you need to do. But I've been very, um, you know, blessed to be a part of some great teams uh, and that also have have great brands to go out and accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish. And the other thing too, is the, some of the themes, uh, at least that I've been a part of is really centered around um, better for you, um, you know, healthier food products, snacking, uh, consumption, instant consumption, and which really fits well into some of the, the macro trends that we're seeing too, with, you know, up until, you know, this past year, less meals at home, more snacking on the go um, and things like that. I think that's a great answer. I really liked, uh, it, of course, and sometimes we were like, yeah, of course, you know, you need a great brand and you need a great team. But oftentimes we don't do what we say or we don't do what we think or what we know. And um, we all do that. We, we all need to check ourselves every so often. I always did. I, I've been in a little bit of a different situation just because I've always been in sort of a startup element some larger teams as I was younger. I had some smaller teams as I've, you know, sort of gotten, gotten into this stage. Um, and I, I like that. I like small, nimble, smart, like just go-getters and who are just excited. And, and, and that speaks to sort of, again, the theme of the team. Like you should, a rule of thumb, you should look around and look to the right and then look to the left of you. And those people should wow you. I, I, again, I, I just, it's a simple rule of thumb. It doesn't need to be CPG. It's any business. If you're in an environment and you're sitting there at your desk, the people to the right and to the left of you should wow you. If they don't, what does that really mean for the company? Who are they hiring? And I, you know, I, I hate to just call it out what it is. That's just reality. And so, you know, some people may be like, oh man, I, I don't know what's going on. But that is really what it is. So that's my take. What, what do you, you know, is that sort of what you mean by that, by team? Yeah, I think cultural fit is super important, right? Um, you want to hire um, folks that are going to fit well within the, the, the team and the overall company culture. Um, so it's really important, I think, that... Um, you know, there's multiple people involved in the interview process uh, so that everybody can get a feel for each other. And I always say too, like the candidate is interviewing us just as much as we're interviewing the candidate. It's a two-way street. And I think that's really important to understand too. Um, and then, you know, depending on the stage of the brand and, and, and the level, oftentimes, and I learned this at, at Pirates Booty, you know, attitude over experience sometimes, especially for those roles that are, you know, in the stores, you know, executing building displays, um, I'd rather, you know, hire somebody that's coming in with, with the passion and the energy and the excitement and the attitude um, than somebody that maybe has a little bit more experience. Uh, I think you're going to get a lot more mileage out of those folks and, um, you know, going to be better, a better fit for the team too. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a, a time in which you bring in somebody that has the experience because I think that's really important too, to shape the the strategy and, and how you go to market and how to avoid certain pitfalls by bringing somebody in that has been there and done that before. Uh, but I think there are certain roles where attitude over experience wins every single time. That is a great way to close this out um, because I really believe in what you just said and also how you articulated it. It's accurate. Um, and, and again, I've talked about it often about sort of the resume thing. I sometimes see this job requirement and or, you know, degree needed and all that. Man, oh man, I would much rather hire a man or woman who just gets it. And what I mean by that is gets it in all ways. That is, understands the brand, is passionate about what and who they are, has the ability to learn, is a go-getter, is just a kind person. Um, if you just kind of wrap all that into something, you know, and, and that is somebody, you can do a lot with that. And that team that you're building around those types of, of, of things can be amazing. Um, 
resumes are great and experience is wonderful. There is nothing to take away from that. But at the end of the day, uh, a, an individual has the ability to, to really do things that are, that are you know, above and beyond um, you know, what they may have done in the past. Yeah, interesting you say that um, because I don't even have a resume. Uh, I haven't gotten a job from a resume in the past 15 years. Um, you know, I'm not encouraging the listeners here to not have a resume, but it is interesting, um, you know, how important other things are outside of the, the piece of paper per se. Great. Well, well said. Well said. Matt Davis, Kettle and Fire, we throw that bad boy up there uh, on the title. Great having you, man. You be well. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you.